Okay, so let's get started. Looks like there was an exam in the previous class. So we are a few minutes behind schedule. So without further ado, let's start. Uh, I had a few slides from last time that I couldn't cover. So I'm going to do that first. And then today we'll talk about uh, distributed middleware. Okay, so if you remember last time I talked about uh, the notion of a disk array, which is RAID. I uh, talked about log structured file system, which are optimized for writes. And then we take those two concepts and uh, put them together. And we have this notion of serverless file system, XFS, where any data can be stored anywhere. Okay? And so here is essentially a concept of how it works. So files are stored as a log, that's log structured file system. But because we are going to use network striping, you take these logs and construct large segments, contiguous segments, and then you have these chunks or segments, you construct a parity from that segment and then you stripe that entire uh, log and the parity group as, uh, as you would do in the RAID 5 and so on. Okay? So it is combining this concept of a log structured file system with software RAID. Okay? And essentially it's using network striping to do all of them. Okay? Uh, that's all I'm going to say as far as XFS is concerned. So let's talk a little bit about some other file systems. Okay, so uh, there's one that we will focus on, which is Hadoop distributed file system that is used for things like map reduce and so. Okay? So this file system is designed for high throughput access to data okay? because it's used in distributed data processing. So uh, it is designed for uh, processing large volumes of data for various uh, application. Okay, so essentially optimized for large data set. Its goal is you want fault tolerance in the same sense as we had in other distributed file systems. If one machine or one disk goes down, you don't want your data to become unavailable. Okay, you want batch processing okay, because uh, general purpose file systems like you have on your machine, laptops, and so on are designed for interactive access. Okay, this file system is designed for uh, the batch application because distributed data processing is batch oriented. Okay, so large data sets and large systems. So you want to scale to hundreds of nodes. Okay, it has a very simple model, which is uh, called the worm model write once, read many. Okay, because these are data sets. Okay, once you create a large data set, you're not going to go modify something in the middle. <coughs> you might add to that data set, you might delete the data set, but it's not like you write a source code file and you keep modifying it. That's not how data sets work. So you are essentially going to assume that these large data sets you create are right ones, which means you create them, you might append to the end, but you are not going to go start modifying them in the middle. Okay? You might use it to construct other data sets and then that data set is its own file and so on. Okay? And as we will see, because it is using Hadoop and can be used for things like Spark, which we'll see hopefully at the end of today's class, uh, you try to move computations to where the data is in order to reduce data movement. Okay. So here's a very high level picture of what the Hadoop file system does. Okay. So first of all, HDFS is not by itself a native file system. It runs on top of standard file system like the Linux file system. So in some sense, think of it as a layer that takes the file system on individual machines and constructs a distributed file system out of it. Okay? So you are just taking machines, disks, and then a standard file system and putting it together. Okay? So here's a picture you want to keep in mind. The yellow boxes here represent individual machines and disks on those machines. Okay, so, so the main concept here is you have some machines that serve as metadata servers. They keep track of where is the data in your file system. Okay? So in this case, the blue node here in this picture is a metadata server. So to access a file, you'll first go to the metadata server. It's like a directory server. It keeps track of where the files are. Okay? And then metadata server is going to say, here is where the blocks to the files are stored. Okay? And each file and block can have a replication factor because we said, you need it to be fault tolerant. So you can take each file and replicate it three times. That's maybe a standard replication factor. Okay? So you'll see here this number three, which says every block has three copies in your file system on three different machines. So you can ask for 
Where is this block stored? You will get a list of three machines. You can go to any one and get that block of the file and so on and so forth. Okay? So all of these green boxes in the yellow, these are blocks and they're replicated. Okay? So two high level principles to keep in mind. Okay? Separation of data from metadata. The metadata is actually stored on a different machine altogether. Okay? So these are metadata nodes and these nodes act as uh, standard data nodes. So the, they basically store chunks of your data set. Okay? That's one. Okay, second is chunks are replicated, but also these chunks are large. Okay, unlike files that have small data blocks, in this case, you have large chunks. Okay, they could be kilobytes or megabytes in size. So you take a large file, you chop it up into larger chunks. I mean, sorry, smaller chunks, but the chunks are large. And then you replicate them and you store them on more than one machine. Okay, each of these machines is a standard, has a standard Unix or file system or a Windows file system or on which you will layer HDFS. Okay. So when you run things like MapReduce, your data is actually stored in HDFS. Typically, you can use other file systems, but that's one that is supported. And you are going to retrieve data from HDFS nodes, process it. Okay. In many cases, the processing nodes could be the same as the data nodes. If you're processing on the processor or GPU, the disks might store the blocks. So that's a picture you want to keep in mind. Okay, And I don't want to say much more about it, but I do want to point out that this idea of separating data from metadata okay, has been used in other contexts. In particular, Google has a file system called GFS, Google File System, okay? also designed for large scalability. Okay? Very similar ideas as HDFS. Okay? So you will see there is essentially a coordinator or a master node and then there are these chunk servers. Okay? The master node is the metadata server. So the separation of data and metadata. Okay? The master node keeps track of the file hierarchy. It keeps track of what are the chunks of the file, which are essentially blocks, what machines are they stored on. It uses a replication factor of three, okay? which is also something that HDFS would use if you use replication. Okay? So every block or chunk is replicated three times and there are these chunk servers, which are essentially running on top of a Linux file system. Okay? Similar idea as HDFS, and here is the client. If the client wants to access a file, okay? first that request goes to the master and say, where is this file store? Okay? So that's your metadata server. It's going to look up the file and return a result, or rather you might say, where is the block of a file stored? You will essentially look up your metadata and say, it's on one of these three nodes, and then you can go to one of those nodes and retrieve the file. Okay. So, so similar ideas. Okay, so the higher level concept you want to take away is in large distributed file systems. Okay, your files are stored on multiple nodes. We saw that in XFS, HDFS, and GFS also have the same concept. Okay. Furthermore, in this case, there is a separation of data and metadata. Okay. So that there are metadata servers and there are data servers. Okay? Now the one difference between XFS and HDFS is both of, uh, and Google file system is all of them have built-in fault tolerance. So if a node fails or a disk fails, you can retrieve uh, the other blocks and figure out how to uh, get your data. Okay? With one difference, here you are actually replicating the blocks three times. Okay. In XFS, you are using software RAID. Okay. So the reason you do this is the uh, disk space is available in, uh, in large amounts because disks have become large. So replicating a block three times. So remember when I talked about mirroring last time, I said you mirror data, you double your storage cost. Here you are tripling the storage cost because the replication factor is three. But it has now become acceptable to pay this price because disks are cheap. Okay? That's the argument. Otherwise, you would have to use something like RAID, where n blocks is protected by single parity blocks. Here, you don't do anything like that. You just uh, have sort of three copies of everything in the file system. Okay. Any questions on this? No question. Yes. Yes. So question is, what is the difference between HDFS and Google file system? I actually put the two together just to show that the, this architecture that is being used is somewhat common. It's used in many file systems. Okay? And there is more commonality here 
in that you have, I mean, the terminology is different, but separation of data from metadata, same concept. Replicate a block is there in both of these. Okay, and uh, essentially, you, it's not a, a native file system is layered on top of another file system. Also true in both cases, you use underlying file system to construct your high level file system. So in some sense, they are very similar to one another. Okay, SDFS is open source, so you can just download it and use it. This is something Google use in its production systems. Okay. Any other questions here? Yes, the similarity was the intent of pointing out that this is a common idea that has been used in many systems. No question. Okay, is that something about atomic rights? Okay, that's a good question. So I didn't mention this here. So this is again similar to HDFS. I said HDFS uses a verb model. The right ones read many. Okay, um, this one has no atomic rights, and also if you update a file, you are going to create a version and things of that. So, okay, so, so it does give you uh, this concept of, okay, rights will go to all three nodes or none at all. So that concept is still there. Okay, that is where atomicity is going to come into play. Other questions? Okay, so what we will do is, okay, there's one more slide actually, I forgot about, uh, let's do this, then we will switch. So the last concept I want to talk about is not a file system, but something called an object storage system. Okay. So this is another way you can store large amounts of data where the, the granularity of what you're storing are not files. So we are used to storing data as files okay, on all machines, whether it's a server, client, and so on. But there is this whole other class of systems also distributed, which are called object storage system. So in this case, you store what are called objects. Objects could be uh, data of varying size. It's like a file, but you don't actually use a file system. Okay, These objects don't have names like you give a name to a file, rather it has a handle. Okay? In many cases, the handle is actually a hash of the contents of the file, okay, or not the file, rather the object. But in some cases, the handle may be independent of the, what, what are the contents. But either way, you have to present a handle and then you have to go get that object. Okay? So instead of reads and writes, which are the common operations in the file system, you have something called a get and a put. Okay? So you use get to read the object, you do put to actually update the object or write to it and things of that sort. Okay, uh, so you don't use block storage in this case, you're going to use object-based storage, but some similar concepts apply. There's separation of data from metadata, uh, there's location transparency and so on. Okay, One example of an object storage system, which you may have used if you use AWS, is uh, the S3 system okay, on Amazon. So that's an example of an object storage system. In that case, the handles are actually URLs. Okay? Every object is given a URL name and you can you do gets and put choosing that name. Okay? And internally, if you use S3, uh, it actually, the S3 stands for simple storage service. Okay, that, That's why it's SSS. Uh, it uses HTTP to do gets and puts and deletes. There's this notion of a bucket, which is the object and you can put data in the bucket and remove it and so on. The URL is the namespace. Okay? Internally also, it uses replication, okay, objects by default are replicated three times, in many cases across data center. So even if an entire data center, not a machine, but the entire data center goes down, your data is still on some other location. Okay? So it uses this geographic replication, which you didn't have in things like HDFS. Yes, question. Question is what is meant by it's not block storage, but object storage. So typically, if you have a file system, data is stored on disks. Okay? Disk essentially is a collection of blocks. So the disk interface is your read and write blocks. Okay? So what the file system does is a file is partitioned into blocks. Blocks are stored on disk. That's how a file system is constructed. In an object storage, you can think of an object as being an entire block but there are varying sizes. Okay? So you're not going to take an object and make smaller blocks and spread these blocks out on disk or anything like that. So the concept is a little different in that you're taking large chunks of data and storing it on some storage system, which is still a disk. Internally, a disk may store it as blocks, but you're not tracking blocks at an object storage level. 
Okay. A file system will ex explicitly take a file and chop it up into blocks and store those blocks. An object storage system will take an entire object and store it. Okay. So, so you should think of an another way to think of this is an object is a uh, block of varying size. So you can just have blocks of varying size. You store the entire block. Okay. That's your question. Okay, what's the advantage of object storage over either file storage or block storage? Right? File storage is tied very closely to block storage because file storage uses block storage. So the reason the use case for object storage is somewhat different from file system and block storage. And uh, I think I sh should have mentioned this here. Uh, common use case is archival storage. This is how you store things like backups. Okay? So you take a backup of your entire disk and you store it as one object. And you are not optimizing object storage system for very heavy throughput applications. If you want to do that, you are better off using a file system. Okay? You are optimizing this for very large amounts of data that you want to store, but you are going to do infrequent reads and writes. Okay? So that's made, so it's designed for a somewhat different use case than file system. I, I'm not saying this is going to replace a file system. It will complement a file system and is used for other types of users where it's better for storing large amounts of data that you will not access frequently. This is also good use case for storing large data sets. Okay? But you don't want to use S3 as your backend to do data processing because data processing applications are going to do heavy reads and writes. But this is good for storing this for long periods of time. So if you want to then do a, a map reduce, you are going to fetch that data and put it in something like HDFS and then process it, okay? So think of this as a way you keep backups of things or keep long-term storage of data sets and things of that sort, okay? Yes, question. Okay. The question is, uh, did object storage system evolve with cloud storage or have they been there for a while. The first thing is object storage systems are newer than file system. File systems have been there for 50, 60 years. Ever since there were operating systems and machines, there have been file systems. Object storage systems are relatively new, but they are not necessarily something that came with the cloud. I think the object storage systems were first uh, designed in the late 90s, early 2000s. So there were papers on this notion of an object storage system for archival storage and so on. With the emergence of cloud, it actually became popular. So you can think of uh, uh, cloud as being the first commercially available object storage system. And previously they were either niche products or research prototypes. Okay, so that's one way to think of it. Anything else? Okay, so let us switch to today's lecture which is on distributed middleware. Okay, we have quite a few different middlewares to look at. And towards the end, I'm going to go back to Hadoop and Spark, which is basically going to do this distributed data processing or things like HDFS and so on. Okay, So let's start with um, EJBs, which is Enterprise Java Beans. Okay? So the first few middleware systems I'm going to talk about, they're based on this notion of distributed objects. Okay? Uh, when we were talking about things like RPCs, RMIs, we touched upon this notion of objects exposing methods. Methods can be invoked on other machines and so on. Okay? Here, we essentially now ha have this notion of an object that itself could be replicated okay? or a state can be distributed. But at its core, it just looks like a simple RPC or an RMI system, which this picture we have seen many times where there is a client machine in fact, I had this very picture in, uh, when we talked about RMIs. We have a client machine, there is a proxy, which is a stub. You make an RMI request, here is the object. Object has some state, it exposes some methods, and you can invoke interfaces that are exposed by the object. Okay? Same picture, but now this object doesn't have to necessarily stay on one machine. The object itself can be distributed, replicated, and so on, okay? for a variety of reasons. So that we have not seen. A middleware system will allow us to do that for fault tolerance reason and many other reasons. Okay? So keep that picture in mind. And let's talk first about 
how you build uh, or how you use Java as a middleware to build higher level application. Okay? So all of you know something about Java. You may have even used it to write your uh, uh, lab, do your lab assignments and so on. So there is a version of Java called Enterprise Java. Okay? This is often used to write your multi-tier applications where the app server is actually written in Java. Okay? So you can, rather than using Python or uh, other uh, languages, you can actually use Java as your app server and you get in the enterprise version of Java some additional functionality that you don't have in your standard Java programming. Okay? The main thing is this concept of a bean. Okay? And essentially bean is a special type of an object. Okay? So this is why you have the name enterprise Java beans or EJBs. Okay? It's a popular way to write enterprise applications, server applications using Java. Okay? So you will see as a middleware, you essentially have your objects written as a bean of some sort. Okay? And I'll talk about them in the next slide. And then you have a number of services that the Java uh, enterprise Java middleware will support. Okay, RMI is what we already know. That's there in standard Java as well. But if you want to use these applications to connect to databases, you have JDBC, which is the Java database connector. Okay? And then if you want to send messages, you have JMIs and so on. So there are a number of these services that are built into the enterprise Java middleware that you can use. Okay, so that allows you to write your applications much more easily. Okay? And the way you will write a EJB application is not very different from where you will write a Java application. Okay? So it will be your program will have a collection of objects. Okay? So each of each object, you will have an interface okay? that is going to tell you what are the uh, methods that are exposed and so on and so forth. And then the implementation of that is called the business logic. Okay? So your, the implementation of the object, because these are business applications, we are going to refer to your interface as the business logic, which is essentially the object and its implementation. Okay? So instead of using client and server in the Java world, we are going to basically, EJBs are used to write web applications. Okay? They often are exposing HTTP interfaces and so on. Okay? So we are essentially, our server is a web application, not just an RMI application. Okay? So, what is this notion of a bean? Okay, so bean, think of bean as a special type of an object. Okay? So you are already familiar with how an object-oriented programming language works. So you have a class when you run this program, you essentially instantiate an object. The object has some memory state. Okay? It has methods you can invoke on it and so on. Okay? Now by default, the memory state is transient in that if you kill the application, the object is gone. Right? The object does not survive application restarts. Okay? In case of Java, uh, Java Enterprise Beans, okay, there are some types of objects that are persistent. Okay? In particular, if you use a stateful bean, okay, the state of the object is going to be automatically persisted by the middleware on disk, which means that you can shut down the pro application and then restart it and read that object back and whatever was the state of the object has been reconstructed, okay? So the object has variables, data structures, whatever it has in it, okay? So it's not just in memory as a, it, you can actually keep it on disk as well, okay? Here you're going to use the serialized, deserialized functionality, the marshalling, demarshalling functionality to take an object and essentially write it out as a byte stream or then reconstruct it at a later time, okay? So that is essentially our, uh, Stays the stateful objects, which is something you will not see in Java. That's something that you only see in enterprise Java. Okay? The stateless beans are essentially uh, objects that don't have any state at all. They might just expose code. Okay? Then you have entity beans that are essentially going to look more like standard Java objects. Okay? And then you have message driven beans, which are essentially de designed for messaging. Okay? They allow you to send messages, messages can persist. Okay, we didn't actually look at message queuing in this class. It was something that we used to have in the previous version of the class. But message queuing systems allow you to send a message and the message is stored by the system until you can take delivery at a later time. Unlike sending a socket message or an RPC, where if the other end 
point is not running, your message is going to be lost. In this case, the system will persist your message. It's like sending an email. If you send the email, it sits in somebody's inbox until they are ready to read it. It's not that if you are not reading email, when it arrives, it disappears. Okay? So you can send messages of this sort, which are more persistent. So that functionality is also available in EJBs. So the thing you want to keep in mind is EJBs allow you to add more function, not allow, support more functionality that makes it easier to write your web application. Okay? So you can have stateful uh, session beans where you can persist the state even if the, uh, when, when the application is shut down, you can use more powerful messaging frameworks and things of that sort. Any questions here? It's a very quick overview, okay? In the two or three slide overview of various systems, just to give you a flavor, okay? We are not going into depth into anything here, but this is like a broad brush overview of several different systems, okay? So next one, which is also object-oriented, is called Corba. okay? This predated Java. So very old middleware. In fact, it's not used anymore, but it's instructive to see because it introduced some concepts that are still there today in other systems. Okay. So Corba, as this is a picture of what Corba does. So at its core, it has something called an ORB or an object, object request bro broker, which is the box you see at the bottom. This is also called the messaging bus. Okay. This is how everything in the system communicates with each other. Okay. So all of these boxes are components and the way they communicate is again using RPCs, but your object request broker is responsible for implementing all your RPC communication or it handles all the communication between objects and clients, uh, it handles heterogeneity issues and things of that sort. Okay. Now you will see that this uh, has many different services. So you have something called horizontal facilities, vertical facilities, which I will show you some examples on the next slide. And then there are common object services and so on. Okay? And this is where the application is. Okay? So those three boxes are what the middleware supports in order for you to write your application. Okay? So it has a large number of services built out of the box. Okay? Anything you think you need is already supported as a service in, in Corba. And here is an example okay, of a service. So if you want to write Threaded applications, there is a concurrency service. If you want to implement a request as transaction, there's a transactional service. If you want to do event notification, there's an event service. If you want to license your software, there's a licensing service. Okay? If you want to persist objects like we had in Enterprise Java, there's a persistence service. Okay? There is a security service if you want to encrypt your communication and so on and so forth. Okay? So they build this heavy duty middleware thinking that if you put all of this functionality inside the middleware, it makes it easier to write applications because you don't need to write a lot of code. You can just use these services to implement your functionality. Okay? That was the premise of Corba. Okay? And if you look at the list of services, you will see that even if you want to write a two-line application, you have to have all of these things running because that is what the middleware actually needs. So as you can see, the downside of Corba is that it's extremely heavyweight. Okay? It has a lot of overhead to when you write application. So things are very slow as a result. Okay? And it never became a commercial success because there was a large learning curve. To, to know how to even write Corba application required that you understand all of this functionality and decide what to use for your application and so on. Okay? So it had good intention, but it was too heavyweight and too, too much, I added too much overhead to write many applications. So it never became a commercial success. Okay? There are still some cases where Corba, some stripped down version of Corba actually got used. Okay? One example where some of the messaging features of Corba are used is, is in Linux. Okay? Linux has this uh, desktop manager called GNOME. Okay, GNOME actually used a stripped down version of Corba, not the full version. Okay? That is what it uses for object communication and things of that. Okay? But by and large, this never took off. Okay? But it introduced several interesting uh, functionality that live on today for uh, in, in sort of other systems. And we'll look at several of them uh, in the next few slides. Okay? So this is the, just the object model of Corba. 
it looks like any other RPC system. Okay, so uh, your stub in this case is called an ORB. Okay, that's what is responsible for messaging. Okay, you are going to have an interface definition language which allows you to. This is like just as you used to use the protobox where you specified your uh, interface and then use the compiler to generate stub code and so on. Very similar. There's an ideal language. You use that. There's an ideal compiler. It will generate all the stub and then you write the application and use RPC like uh, semantics to uh, invoke uh, the, the server end and so on. Okay. Now, interestingly, uh, when we talked about RPC, you may remember I said you can have synchronous RPC, you can have one way RPC, you can have deferred synchronous RPC. This is where it all came from. They decided that you don't want to just do synchronous, users might require other semantics. Let's build them all. Okay. So our core bias, all the semantics we talked about are all built in. So when you say, I want to make an RPC, you have to specify which kind, because they come in many flavors and all of them are supported. Okay. And you remember, or probably remember some of this, I'm not going to go into what is synchronous one way and so on, but we have studied that and this is where it originated from. Okay. Now here are some other things that we have not seen. Corba has an event notification service. Okay? And this is done using this notion of an event channel. Okay? The event channel allows you to uh, implement an application in what is called the publish subscribe model or a pub sub model. Okay? It's a popular way of writing messaging application. Okay? What is a pub sub model? So you want to, the way you communicate is by publishing events. Events could be just some data. Okay? And then other uh, consumers are going to consume this data by subscribing to events. Okay, so you can say, I'm interested in event of this type. Okay, and then you specify that to the middleware. So Corba has this event channel that's sitting in between. So sub publishers are publishing event. They're just producing data and pushing it into the event channel. Here are your consumer applications that say, I'm interested in this type of event, this type of event, and so on. So you're subscribed to some events. Whenever there's a match of whatever you're subscribed, the event channel will essentially deliver that event to you. Okay? So this model of communication okay, has lived well beyond Corba because still there are many applications that are messaging based that are based on this publish subscribe model. Okay? And now there are several things that you want to keep in mind, which is, how do events go from the publisher to the event channel, which suppliers or publishers, and how do they go from the event channel to the consumer? Okay. The standard one is called push-push, where publishers publish data and send that to the event channel. So they're pushing it into the event channel. And the event channel will look at a list of consumers who are subscribed to various events. Whenever there's a match, it will push it to the consumer. So that's a push-push model. You can also have a pull-pull model, where the event channel asks each of the publishers saying, do you have any new event or data to publish? And you're pulling data or events from the publishers into the event channel. And the consumer can also pull data from the event channel by pulling things, is there any new data and so on. Okay? And you can have any combination. Okay? Publishers can push, consumers can pull and so on. Okay? So that's how data is going to flow from uh, the publishers to the uh, to the consumers. And here you see a picture where you're doing a full pull model. The previous picture showed you push. This is essentially the pull style model. Okay. So this is something that was a design, uh, the part of the Corba design that has lived well beyond. Okay? Lots of messaging applications are essentially built on event channels where the middleware is an event bus. Okay. If you know modern uh, open source applications like Kafka and many others, they are essentially using this type of model in them. Okay. Now, there is, um, uh, I said that Corba actually supports things that go beyond our standard synchronous model. You can have things like asynchronous RPC, deferred synchronous RPC and so on. The way it's implementing it is that there is a callback model so you can say, I make an asynchronous request. So I'm not going to block on that request. I make a request and I continue execution. Okay? In the meantime, the middleware has sent that request to the server, the server processes it, reply comes back. Okay? How does the client know its reply has eventually arrived? 
because you send an asynchronous RPC. So the way it is done is you essentially have a callback. The orb is going to send you a notification saying your reply has arrived. Okay, and then you go and actually get the reply from the system. Okay, so there's asynchronous notifications when the replies come back. So that's all built into our RPC system. So you will have a callback interface where you can register a callback function. Whenever your reply to your asynchronous RPC comes back, you are essentially notified, and then you can get your reply. Okay. So that's how Corba implements this uh, asynchronous RPC. Okay. You can also have polling based method. As I said, you can think of any method to do this. Corba supports it. So rather than having a callback, okay, you are essentially uh, you can also do polling where you keep polling. Has my reply come back every once in a while? So there's a polling based interface, and eventually when the uh, response comes back, you poll for it and you get the reply. Okay. So either you are notified or you poll. Okay. So it's just a push and pull. So even for asynchronous RPC, both of these methods are supported. Any questions on this? Okay. So that's all I'm going to say about Corba. Okay. Heavyweight middleware, lots of functionality. Okay. Uh, didn't really succeed because of its high overhead. But the uh, event bus or the event channel, which allowed you to do publish subscribe, that's something that has been adopted by other systems. Okay? Now we are going to switch gears and talk about Microsoft's middleware systems, okay? which have had different names over the years. Okay? It uh, is now it's called .NET, which you probably have heard of. Okay? And previous name was actually called DCOM. So DCOM has evolved into .NET as it's mentioned there. Yeah, so DCOM stands for Distributed Component Object Mode. It's yet another object-oriented uh, middleware system. Here you can see essentially the layers in, uh, in DCOM. It's quite complicated as you can see, but there is a history of how it evolved this way. Okay? So um, essentially DCOM has a COM layer, then there's an OLA layer. OLA stands for Object Linking and Embedding. Then there's an ActiveX layer, and then there's a distribution of all of this. Okay. So the original client server applications allow, were essentially allowed you to do in the Microsoft world, is allowed you to essentially use this COM library that allowed communication within a machine. Okay. One pro application could send a message to another application on the same machine, not across a network. Okay. That was called COM. So it was essentially inter-process communication on a single machine. Okay. So using COM, Microsoft built this layer called, so the main use case for Microsoft was they had office applications, okay? So office applications might need to communicate with each other, okay? Why? Because you can embed an Excel spreadsheet into a Word document, okay? And then, or you can essentially put a picture into a PowerPoint document. When you click on that embedded document, it actually opens in the original application. So if you actually embed a, Excel table into Word, and you double click on it, it will actually open in Excel. Okay? So this requires that Word can communicate with Excel, and then you edit, you save, and that those data gets imported back into Word. So for Office applications to communicate with one another, they essentially use the COM layer. And they added something called object linking and embedding, or OLA layer, that allowed you to link one document inside another, Excel inside Word, or, or maybe an Excel uh, bar graph in a PowerPoint document and things like this, okay? So, so this whole use case for Microsoft was, let's allow our office applications to communicate with each other, okay? And then on top of that, they added, uh, when uh, with the evolution of the web, they also had to add something for Internet Explorer, which was the popular browser at that time. So they essentially added something called ActiveX, that allowed you to embed things in web documents, not just my office documents, okay? that allowed you to do ActiveX. Okay? And then they said, maybe clients and server applications don't run on the same machine, they can run on multiple machines. Okay? So then they made the whole thing distributed. So they took COM and made it distributed that just allowed you to do RPCs across machines. Okay? Well, not really RPCs, they're RMIs because all of these is object oriented. Okay. So your objects, object export methods, methods can be invoked by other objects and things of that. So, okay. That's a history, okay. 30 year, 40 year history of how 
this all of this has evolved in the Microsoft. Word. So now all of this is in .NET. So you can write applications in C Sharp or Java, and then they all work because it's platform and language agnostic. The middleware where you can actually do this across languages. Okay. So so I already said all of this. Okay. So you had COM, then OLA, which was object linking and embedding. Then you had web-based features for ActiveX, and then DCOM. Okay. So if you look at the client server picture, okay, this picture, all of these pictures look the same. Okay, just the terminology is different. It's essentially an RPC or an RMI system where you have the stub is now essentially your COM layer. Okay, that's called COM in, uh, and proxies in the Microsoft world. Uh, these are your stubs, you have your objects that are sitting on the server. Your client application makes an RMI call. It goes through the COM layer or the DCOM layer actually, and then goes to the object, invoke the method, process it, send back a reply. Okay, all of that is still the same. Okay, essentially at its core, it's a uh, RMI based system on objects. Okay, and very similar uh, concepts as Corba. Okay, you have something called a service control manager, SCM which is going to keep track of what all objects are in the system, where are they running? It's like the naming service. Okay, so it's called a service control manager. Okay, so it keeps track of where the services are running and so on. Okay, now similar to enterprise Java beans, okay, uh, objects in DCOM can also be persisted. Okay, so you will see that there are essentially uh, some objects, so, so by default, DCOM objects are transient. That's like a standard RPC RMI object. Okay? But you can essentially have persistent objects also. If you have make an object persistent, your DCOM layer will store its state on disk. If you restart the application, you can get back the object exactly the way it was before you stored it on disk. Okay? So you don't have to uh, throw out the object state. The state can be persisted on disk. Okay? So that is essentially done using this notion of a moniker. Okay. Moniker is a name for a persistent object that allows you to reconstruct that object after uh, you shut down your application, the server application. Okay. So you have essentially a client moniker that allows you to look up what is the name of the object. Okay. You have a moniker also that allows you to then load the object from disk and reconstruct its state and so on. Okay. So similar concept to EJBs. Okay. Because I should said that stateful Java beans allow you to persist that state to this. Here you have the same concept for standard objects by associating a name to it, which is called a moniker, and then instructing DCOM to persist it, and then it will become persistent. Okay. So more advanced features of distributed object-oriented systems that you have not see when you write Java applications or Python applications, but all of them are present in these middleware systems. Okay. All right, so I'm going quickly. So if you have questions, you should ask because we have only two, three slides per system. Okay, so I'm going to switch gear and talk about a completely different type of middleware, which is called a distributed coordination middleware. Okay, so in this case, uh, you have a very loose coupling between how communication works. Okay, and the idea is you want to separate your computations from coordination. So what does that mean? Okay, so you can think of uh, the coupling between clients and servers as being coupled in time or coupled in space, which means that uh, they are either communicating at the same time, okay, both the client and the server, or they are uh, essentially um, communicating in the same space. Okay? So the example of both temporal and uh, spatial or referential coupling is direct communication, client and the server, are both running, they are communicating at the same time. Okay? Uh, where it is decoupled in space, but is at the same time is a meeting oriented communication where you say there's a meet, the, the way to think about this is an analogy. So you can announce that I have office hours at 4 p.m. Okay? And it's going to be in this room. Okay? So that message is not sent to anyone in particular, it's just broadcast and whoever is interested just shows up. You know where to go for communication to occur. Okay, so you all go at this, to that one location and then you can discuss office in this case, any questions you have in the office. Okay, Think of applications that are uh, written in the same way where you say, 
okay if you want to communicate you here is the space that you use to communicate but you don't actually say uh, process a wants to communicate with process b this is how you do direct communication you address your messages to a particular recipient in this case you are not going to do that you essentially have meeting oriented communication okay now you can have communication that's decoupled in time and that is email where when you send an email you don't expect an instant response okay the mail gets stored somewhere in somebody's inbox they read it at a later time and a message uh, comes back okay so it is decoupled in time because messaging is not synchronous but it is coupled in space in that you are actually addressing your messages to someone you send an email to a particular recipient okay now you have this fourth region where you have something that decoupled in time and space okay what that means is you are going to send messages that's not addressed to anyone in particular and delivery of that message can be taken at an arbitrary later time okay? so is it neither happening synchronously at the same time nor is it happening uh, by addressing the messages to someone in particular okay? and that is called generative communication and which brings us to this notion of distributed communication okay it uses a publish subscribe model which we just saw in the event bus okay so you will see that your distributed coordination architectures are also going to be publish subscribe because if you don't want to address a message to anyone in particular you are going to publish events with a certain type and let someone else take delivery at some later time okay so here is a use case of a system that is built this way okay so this is a java based middleware called genie okay it uses distributed coordination okay so first thing is it has something called a discovery service okay so you are not you don't know what entities are present in the system so you have this notion of discovery that allows you to discover what services are available and so on okay the easiest way to think of this where this is actually uh, used in one common use case is how your machines can now discover printers on the network okay in the in at least 10 years ago if you wanted to print to a printer you had to pre configure that printer on your machine you had to know its ip address model and so on okay now if you have windows or mac or even linux you just connect it to a network a new wifi network and you look in the printer tab it would have discovered all the printers if there are any in the network and show you okay how is this happening this is happening because uh, the printers are advertising their services your machine is discovering print services and showing you a list okay so uh, this is also called uh, there's a term for this in system administration it's called zero configuration or zero conf where you don't have to pre configure thing things uh, services get discovered on the fly and they get configured on the fly okay the uh, middlewares like genie allow you to do something like this because they have uh, event more, more and a notification system that is publish subscribe based okay so let's first talk about how it works then we can understand how you can implement this print service example that i just showed okay so genie uh, uses what is called a bulletin board architecture the best way to think about this is a physical bulletin board that you see in any academic building on camp right so how does it work you want to let's say you are trying to sell some furniture okay what would you do you make a notice saying i am selling my sofa okay and if you are interested call me at this number or email me and you put it up on the bulletin board that is not addressed to anyone in particular okay you just post it saying if some interested party comes and looks for it then they will communicate with you okay so it's decoupled in time because you don't expect to get a message anytime soon or ever because no one may be interested in buying a sofa when you want to sell it okay and second is it is also decoupled in space which means that you are not address that to anyone in particular okay? you didn't send a message to your friend saying i'm sending a sofa you just put a general announcement saying i okay so so that's not addressed to anyone neither do you expect a reply at any uh, uh, quickly okay same concept is true in a distributed system okay messages are going to get posted to a bulletin board they are not addressed to anyone in particular okay clients can come and look for certain types of messages they care about and if there is a match then they will communicate with whoever posted that message 
Okay, so this bulletin board in the in this genie case is called a Java space. It's actually a shared database. Okay, there's your, your because you are going to post messages that go and shit in a in a uh, uh, shared data space that has tuples. You can make queries to see if there are matching objects and so on. Okay, so with that background, you can now think of this printer example. Okay, so how is that when you connect your machine, it actually can find printers on the network. Okay? Now, technically, the, the, your computer is not using a genie based architecture, but this is just one example of how you could implement it. Okay? So, you will say, I have this Java space, which is a shared bulletin board. Any entity that wants to advertise a service goes and advertises them. So, so every printer on the network can go and say, I am a printer my model HP color printer, here's my IP address. And then another printer can say, yeah, I'm a black and white printer. I'm at this location and so on. So you go and post all of these messages on the Java space. If you have now a client machine, it wants to discover printers. It will go and say, are there services of type print? Okay. And then some of them will match. Not everything would be a print service and whatever matches, you will read them. And then you now have a list of printers in the environment. So this is a simple way of implementing discovery services where you advertise the services, okay, posting it on the bulletin board is like advertisement, and then you query for advertising, and then you discover what is in your environment. Okay. So you can have lots of things that look like this. Right? So uh, if you have, let's say, a, a streaming device, a hardware device, many times you have applications that can automatically discover and say, I found a uh, streaming TV, okay, and things of that sort. That's because they're all advertising themselves. A lot of these IoT devices, they work by advertising their service. Some other client can go and discover that service. So you can say, I found a smart light bulb, or I found a streaming TV, and things of that sort. Okay? So this notion is useful in many of these contexts where you don't want to configure. Okay, If you didn't do this, you would actually need to keep a file saying, here are the printers, these are the IP address, then the user has to go and configure it on the network or on the machine, and which is a lot of manual work. All of that is saved in this case. Okay, this is one use case for Genie. There are many others for this black uh, bulletin board architecture. Any questions here? Okay, so here is the approach. So it's going to be based on a publish subscribe paradigm. Okay, there are publishers that are publishing their services. They're advertising their services. They do this by pushing this into a shared bulletin board. This, this box is a logical view of a shared bulletin board. And there are subscribers that are reading or trying to query saying, are there messages that are of this type? Or you can say, I want to subscribe to any message of type print. If any new message comes, notify me. Okay, you can either poll or you can essentially get push depending on your subscription. Okay, so either way you are going to subscribe and then if there are matching events, you are going to be notified. Okay, That's the basic concept. Okay, here is how uh, you can actually uh, see an example. This is again your Java space, which is a shared bulletin board. So that is a publisher. It's going to say, I advertise service A. That's going to go into your bulletin board. Okay, here is another one that says, I advertise service B. That's a right that goes into the bulletin board. Okay. And now you have a, a consumer that is going to go and say, do you have any entries or advertisement that match a certain criteria? Okay. If that matches C, you can essentially read C. Okay. You can optionally delete C as well saying, I took delivery, so remove it. Okay. Or you can leave it there saying, let others also read C, depending on what kind of data it is. Okay. So you essentially have reads and writes into a shared database or a shared tuple space, which is called a Java space in this case. And uh, yes, go ahead. Okay, question is, where is this Java space running? Uh, because the publishers are publishing, the subscribers are subscribed, right? So, so Java space is your middleware service. The middleware service has to run on some server or some set of servers, right? So these are all uh, applications that are reading or writing data to a server. 
Okay. Uh, so essentially your middleware is running somewhere else. Okay. And then you, so you have to essentially uh, read and write from that middle. Okay. So here is uh, uh, another example where you essentially have a publisher that writes C. This subscriber has already subscribed to all events of that type. And uh, when C gets published, you are going to get notified because that's your event channel, right? So it's a publish subscribe event channel. You say, here is a new tuple C. Is there anyone who subscribed to this type? If so, you are going to notify and then this entity is going to come and take delivery, okay? So the previous one was pull based where you are explicitly reading. Here you have notifications coming and then you read. So here are some details. So this was the question that was asked, where is this Java space implemented? So this picture shows you essentially an implementation view of the Java space. First thing you will see is that your Java space is distributed across multiple machines. So you see that there are essentially three machines and those boxes are essentially Java spaces with tuples in them. Okay? And you see a, a, a process that's trying to write. Okay? So while it is distributed, you can also have a replication if you want, okay? So the first case is essentially a replicated Java space where every bulletin board has the same copy of all the tuples. So think of them as three bulletin boards. Each of them has exactly the same copy, okay? So every write has to be broadcast to all of the Java spaces. And then reads can go to a local Java space and read because it's just going to have the same entry, okay? This is analogous to, you have a bulletin board on each floor of the building. Every person who posts a flyer has to post the same flyer on all of them. So they have the same content. So then you just go to a local bulletin board and take delivery of whatever you want. You don't need to query anything else, okay? So writes are broadcast, reads are local. So your read is a local event, okay? That's one way you can implement a Java space. This is a replicated one, okay? Here is a distant Java space, it's unreplicated, okay? So what this means is that each bulletin board will have a separate set of content. You can go and post on any one you want. So your rights are going to be local. So if you want to post a flyer, you will post it on the local one, but reads have to be global because if you want to see if there is a certain entry of a certain type, you have to query all the bulletin. Is somebody selling furniture? You go look on all the bulletin board to see if there is a match because you don't assume that the flyer is going to be posted on all of them, okay? So reads are going to be sent to all, but writes are local. It's the exact opposite of what we had in the previous one where writes are broadcast, but reads were local, okay? So you can configure your Java space in either way, okay? uh, depending on what, what properties you're trying to get out of the system. Any questions on this? Yes. Are you asking how a tuple is posted? I'm not following the question. Yeah, so the tuple would have something like the Okay, and now I understand the question. The question is, uh, whatever is being posted into a Java, into tuple space, is that a Java object? And how is, is, are you copying the Java object or are you sending the Java? Okay, that's your question. The first thing is in this case, tuples are not Java objects, they're data objects, okay? It's like a key and a value, okay? So because if you are advertising a print service, you are saying here's a print service and the value is, this is the model of the printer's IP address, it's not really code, okay? It's like, it's a, like a, think of it as a database. So it's a record in a database. It's not an object with code and methods in it. Okay? So, so we are not publishing objects, we are actually publishing data or events, okay? which is somewhat different from essentially sending objects and receiving objects. Okay? Anything else? Okay. All right, so last thing we'll talk about in the next 10, 15 minutes is distributed data processing. This is essentially different types of middleware that are designed for processing large amounts of data. 
Some of you may be familiar with this if you've taken one of the uh, systems for data science class where some of this material is covered, but we'll do it in a, in a sort of a brief manner here. So we'll talk about what's a data processing framework, what does MapReduce framework do, how does Spark implement some of these ideas and so on. Okay. So first thing you want to keep in mind is there are many distributed applications where you're trying to process very large amounts of data. Okay. Lots of log files or lots of image files. Okay. You can have um, uh, bioinformatic applications where you are doing processing over uh, data that are genomic data and things of that sort. So, so also financial data, clinical data. So many different domains produce large data sets. Okay? And you have a need to process a large data set to understand something, to get some insights, to make a query and so on. So a distributed data processing system or a platform is designed to allow you to process very large amounts of data uh, efficiently. Okay? So, so that's the high level concept of what uh, we want to do here. And the basic idea is you're going to use multiple machines of a cluster and parallelize your application for data processing. Okay? Because you have a large data set, you don't want to have one process that is reading that entire data set sequentially and trying to process. That's going to take too long. So you essentially run multiple applications or processes. Each of them reads a chunk of your data set and processes it, and then you aggregate your results. Okay? So that's how you're going to parallelize your data processing okay? or a large data set. So you'll use a cluster, the cluster will essentially run processes, each of them processes some part of the data. Okay? And one popular model to do this is called MapReduce, okay? which you may have heard of also. Okay? So what happens in a MapReduce is a two-stage process to process a large data set. Okay? So there's a map phase and there's a reduce phase. Okay? So here, what you're showing is, uh, so when you start processing it, you will have a set of nodes. In this case, there are three machines and they are processes. Each process reads a part of the data, okay? And then it does some local processing and then it's going to send it to the next phase, okay? So that next phase is called a shuffle. So to send the data, you essentially do a shuffle and then you have a, uh, a reduce phase where you're receiving partially processed data from the math phase and then you're doing the final process, okay? So think of it as two stages of processing. So your first stage that does the initial, reads the data, does some processing, and then decides where to send it, which node to send it for the final processing, okay? And then you process it and then you get the output. Okay? The way, one way to think about it is, you can do something like sorting, okay? So that's a very simple example. So a very large data set, you want to sort it. Okay? So you all understand how sorting works, right? So what will the map phase do? Because the, your unsorted data. Okay? So what you can say is I'm going to read the data and then I'm going to see, so let's say you're trying to sort it, but you know the range of the values. Okay? Let's say it's alpha, you're sorting words. So words only, they start from A to Z, right? So you're basically going to say, I look, read, the, read each word. And so that in my map phase, I decide where to send it for sorting. So you'll say, first few uh, parts of the alphabet is going to be uh, processed by node one, the next in node two and node three and so on. So the word starts with A, you will send in the shuffle phase, you'll send all words starting from A to let's say D, go to for one node, then, then E to F go to here and then so on and so forth. So, so in the map phase, you're just reading data and then you're just sending it to whichever node is going to do the final processing. And here you will actually then take all of those words and sort it and produce the produce a list. Okay. Very simple example of how you can use these two stages to do something like sorting. And there are many other things you can do with MapReduce as well, but that's a uh, basic idea. Any question MapReduce? Okay. Now, earlier on, I talked about HDFS. Okay. The data sets that are being uh, processed here are actually stored on HDFS. Okay. So there are many things you can do. Each node can read its local data from HDFS. It can also read remote data. Okay? And depending on how you construct your queries, if you are reading remote data, that's going to be more expensive. If you read it locally, you will have lesser overheads, but that depends again on how the data is stored and which nodes are doing MapReduce processing and so on. Okay? 
Okay, so that's the basic concept of a map reduced programming model and it's being used in many different contexts. So your map shuffle and a reduce. Okay. So there are similar other programming models also. Okay, so you can have graph based processing. Microsoft has something called Dyrad and Nayad. And then there is in-memory data processing that's done also called Spark. We'll talk about that in the next slide. You can then assume that your data is a graph and do graph processing. Okay? So many different types of parallel data processing models have been designed depending on what is the structure of the data. If your data is a graph, like it's a large social network graph and you want to analyze it, use a graph based model. If your data set is a set of records, you can essentially use MapReduce or Spark and things like that. Okay? And then there is something called streaming data processing where the data is not stored a priori on disk. Okay, data is being streamed to you, it's coming in real time. You're processing it as it comes in. Okay, a lot of this might be because you might have new data arriving. essentially the Hadoop ecosystem. Okay? Hadoop has actually grown into a very large number of components because it is a, uh, it has many, uh, many uh, different types of functionality in it. So it has, at its bottom layer, it has a storage manager. Where are the data sets stored? SDFS is a file system way to store your data. Set. You can use EdgeBase and Kafka, which are other ways you store your data, data in sort of database format or in a, uh, distributed processing format and so on. Okay? So that's your storage layer. Then you have your processing layer in Hadoop, which can be map reduce, where you use map or reduce, or you can use Spark, which use in-memory data processing, which we'll talk about. Okay? And at the very top, your resource manager that allocate nodes and resources to jobs. And here you can have things like Yarn and Mesos. And Mesos we have seen when we talked about cluster management. Okay? Mesos was designed with map reduce and spark in mind where you have different spark jobs coming in and then you can decide how to allocate servers in a cluster to that job okay but uh, once you do that then you'll either have map reduce or spark running that job using data from hdfs or edge base and things of that so okay here's a picture of what i showed in the previous slide okay so this is a storage layer okay you don't have typically all of them you pick one or two okay so you might say, I use HDFS to store my data, I use H, H, HBase or something like that. Okay? Then you have the scheduler that decides, or a resource manager that decides how am I allocating nodes to jobs. Okay? So you can do either Yarn or Mesos, they are very similar, we did Mesos already. Then you have data processing framework. Okay? MapReduce is just one of them, but there are, there is uh, Apache Spark, there's Apache Fling, there's Storm and TS, and, and there are a whole number of others. Okay. And there are application programming frameworks at the top that allow you to write queries over large data sets. How are you going to specify what processing you want to do? Okay. So that you can write in languages like Hive and Pig, and then that get compiled into a query. It comes to the data processing framework that runs it. Okay. So you will see that uh, this is not just a single distributed application. It is a set of applications that work together. A distributed file system, a distributed resource manager, a data processing framework, and a programming language. Okay? So a fairly complicated ecosystem if you think about all of the layers. Okay, so I'm not going to go into all of this, but, but to this, there have been lots of other things that have been added, like graph processing frameworks, machine learning frameworks, you probably know a little bit about TensorFlow, MLib, PyTorch, and all of these. They can also be plugged into these type of frameworks and coexist with uh, MapReduce and Spark and things of that. Okay. All right, so let's talk about Spark in the next few minutes and then we will stop. Okay, so Spark was an important innovation over MapReduce. Okay. And the reason was, the, although MapReduce uses parallelism by using many machines, it is very heavy on IO. Okay? It reads lots of data. During shuffle, you can actually shuffle by putting the data on disk 
and the reduce phase can read the shuffle data from this. Okay? So there is a lot of I.O. going on that can slow down the application. So the main insight on Spark was store intermediate data in memory. Okay? Servers have lots of RAM. When I'm processing my data, I put all my intermediate data in some RAM of some machine rather than putting it on disk. If you have data in memory, you can process it much faster. Okay? Now you have to keep in mind that the data sets are large, so not all of your data might fit in memory. So what you decide to store, how you store it, that's something you have to think about when you write a Spark application. Okay? So essentially, uh, so that at its core is what Apache Spark does. It takes a map reduce style model, but the intermediate data is stored in data in memory data structures that are called RDDs, which I'll show you on the next slide. Okay? And then you can then use uh, this intermediate data in memory and then as essentially access data in any server's memory to do further processing. Okay? So that's the basic idea. And then on top of that, there are many other things that have been added to it. There's a graph processing layer for Spark. There's a machine learning Spark ML, the Spark machine learning. It's like TensorFlow and PyTorch, but runs on Spark. The Spark streaming, you can use Spark as a regular database, write SQL queries and so on. So many different front ends or higher ends to essentially work with your data. Okay. And here is the notion of what uh, RDDs do. So essentially a resilient distributed data set, you should think of it as distributed memory. So far, we haven't actually talked about distributed memory. In fact, we, we didn't even use this concept. But what is distributed memory? Think of it as just as in main memory, you can just go and access using a point or some object that is stored in memory. Now, assume that you can do this across machines. You can say, I want this object. It's not a memory pointer, but you have a handle that allows you to go and get an object regardless of where it's stored in the network. So all of the, uh, the memories of the servers essentially can be accessed if you store data in the form of an RDD. So the idea is you will first read your data from disk, say HDFS, you will do some partial processing that intermediate data is going to be stored as a data set in RDD, a transformed data set. Then you perform additional transformation, it creates new RDDs and so on. Okay? But because the data is in memory, your processing is much, much faster than using standard map radius, which always keeps his data on disk. Okay? So that's the basic idea in Spark. Okay? Now, there are many interesting things that you have to do. If you store data in memory, you can say, what if one machine fails? Because this is a cluster, right? Are you going to then lose your data? Uh, certainly whatever is in memory is gone. Okay? So you can't say, let's keep storing it on disk to back it up, but then you have introduced IO. So what Spark will do is it has this notion of recomputation. So it keeps track of how each no data, uh, how each of the data that's stored in an RDD was derived. If you lose data, it will re-execute all of the components, computational components that were used to derive that data. Okay? So it will trigger this automatic recomputations. Okay? So that's not mentioned here, but that's essentially how you get, that's why it's called resilient. Okay, the resilient part comes because even though it's a, a data that's stored in memory, server failures can be handled by recomputation. You don't actually use any other way of redundancy or anything like that. You just recompute. Okay? So that is the main concept. So you cache objects in a RAM and then you speed up your distributed data process. Internally, you can use the same concept as map reduce. Okay? It is just that when you do shuffle and all of that, you can actually store your intermediate data in memory as opposed to on disk. Okay? So that I think is the main uh, advantage of uh, Spark. So you will see here as an example of a Spark job. So you have first the data set, you read it, you put it in RDDs, you do transformations, you construct new data structures that are also stored in memory, you do further transformations, create more data sets, and then you do final processing. So you can have many stages of processing of your data. At the end of each stage, you construct some transformed data from the previous version, put it back in memory, then you do further processing and so on. Okay? So you see that your data processing looks like a graph. Okay? So you can have arbitrary graph structures depending on how the data is processed in a Spark job. Okay? Each of this is essentially 
something you keep in memory, but if, if a node fails and this one gets deleted, you are going to rerun the computation because you know how it was derived. Okay, so you just run that part of the graph computation again and you reconstruct, okay, that's the general idea. Any questions on this? So we are a little bit over time, so let's talk.